Hello, it's Sarah Jane again as we continue to explore some of the biggest issues facing the National Health Service at the moment. We really wanted to spend an episode focusing on mental health. It's something that we highlight regularly on my TV show on Sky News. It's such a wide ranging topic. We've discussed everything from the effect of social media on young people to the lack of discussion about suicide and its prevention to the waiting times for support. And the most startling line you'll hear from this episode, I'd say, is that before the pandemic, one in nine children needed help with their mental health. It's now one in six. Huge challenges. And we'll talk about how far we've come. I remember what the asylums were like. I I remember Free and Barnet, the very long white corridor that was incredibly intimidating. And so it is important to remember it's not the same as it was then. But like our other episodes, let's hear from some of you first. Hiya, I'm India. I have a seven-year-old son who's been suffering with anxiety for about three, four years now. When he's at school, he sometimes asks, is mummy okay? Um, Can I talk to her? I feel like something's going to happen to her. I feel like someone's going to take her, but the problems really come in at night. He's convinced that I will, for some reason, die in my sleep or somebody will take me. The waiting time for a doctor was very, very long, so it took a long time for us to actually get a referral to CAMS. They said, sorry, we cannot help you because there's various other factors within his life where we're not fit for purpose to help and just shut the door on him. I felt so, so angry and let down. And I just thought, wow, it's like history repeated itself because this basically happened to me when I was a child. It's really heartbreaking to see my son like that, knowing there's nothing I can do. I worry about his education a lot and how his anxiety impacts it. I have a strong suspicion my son has ADHD But CAMS won't test him or even look into it until he's at least eight. It's made harder by the fact I myself have mental health issues and I'm also on the spectrum. We've recently relocated and I'm really hoping that the services in our new area are going to be a lot more supportive than previous services. Personally, I feel like the system is backwards. It needs to be preventative rather than to come into people's lives when they're at crisis. And that would make a massive difference to millions of people's lives. So David Nicholson is back with me. He used to run the NHS in England. And for this episode, we're speaking to someone shortly who doesn't actually work in the NHS, but very closely with it and the people trying to access mental health services. But first, David, just give us a potted history of mental health services. As far as the NHS is concerned, it literally goes from Rampton and Broadmoor, high security services through medium and low security, through to community-based services. It covers learning disabilities, autism, dementia care, a whole range of things. My guess in the conversation we're going to have, we're going to narrow that down a bit. Nevertheless, when people talk about it, they often mean all of those things rather than they're not. I came into the NHS in the mid 70s and for the first 10 years worked on what in those days was the closure of the big asylums, the 1,000, 2,000 bedded mental illness hospitals, which were dotted all around the country. A massive set of transformational change went on there and the creation of community services alternatives to hospital. In parallel with that, you have a set of legal reforms. So As attitudes to mental health change, so the legal framework, the new Mental Health Act, it's been trailed a long time. And I think we're all disappointed that the King's speech did not include it. So what's going to happen in terms of mental health legislation, given the amount of work that was done by everyone to get it into a decent place? We none of us know. Services have moved quite significantly, I think, uh, forward, but they've been predominantly kind of designed top down. I think we're moving to a phase now where local services and local organisations working in partnership 
need to have much more freedom to start to organise services in the way that suits the local community. I'm currently working in the black country, which has an enormously strong sort of voluntary, community-based attitude to, to everything. And that's a different, for example, that might do in an inner city where you don't have those sorts of things. It's like it needs to be much more locally driven. There's more awareness and more diagnoses now within the NHS when it comes to mental health right now is demand outstripping supply, if you like. One of the things that COVID did, it accelerated a whole set of social and attitudinal changes in society. And the mental health one was one of them. Predominantly in quite a good way, in the sense that people are much more likely to talk about it now. There still is a, st a stigma in some circumstances, but actually... You know, the more people talk about it, the more it's exposed to public gaze, the more people understand themselves. I think this is a very positive thing. What I don't think's happened is we've sufficiently then thought about how do the services we currently have fix with this different environment where people need more support, probably slightly less treatment. And where there are gaps as a nation, we are so lucky that there are organisations there to help organisations like the charity Mind. Dr Sarah Hughes, the CEO of Mind. Sarah, really good of you uh, to join David and I to talk about this a little bit more. Perhaps you can give us an idea of where you think mental health sits within the NHS at the moment. I've worked in mental health for 35 years and so I remember what the asylums were like. I, I remember Free and Barnet, the very long white corridor that was incredibly intimidating. And so it is important to remember how far we've come. And it's not the same as it was then. This is not necessarily about more money into the system. It's about how we deliver the services. What do we deliver? In what way? With whom? And I think it's right to say that we've got lots of charities all around the country supporting the NHS in delivering a great deal of innovative and community resources every day. The reality is, I think, the NHS in some ways is responding to a growing social need without necessarily the resources to support positive interventions and outcomes. And so it's a really difficult picture, but one that I think we have to be, I have a sort of saying um, that I stole from somebody else, but provocative optimism, which is, the culture of the NHS in, in mental health terms, we've got an amazing national team at NHS England that really think very deeply about mental health in a way that I think is incredibly broad and important to exactly attend to what David said, which is the social needs of people are different. So how do we be radical and transformative in developing services that truly meet people's needs today? And there are opportunities through integrated care systems and so on to do so. I love that phrase, provocative optimism. I'm going to steal that from you and pass it on. I think that is the perfect phrase and it's what we're trying to do with this podcast series. There are some pitfalls here we just need to be careful about. One of them is the medicalization of everything. If you're not careful, you end up saying that doctors are the answer to most healthcare needs and they're not by an absolute massive margin. The dangers of over-medicalizing uh, mental health services for young people are very significant. The NHS now, the NHS in the future, needs not to think about we're only interested in the things that we are narrowly interested in and somebody else will do something else. Loneliness is a good example. Things like warm spaces where NHS staff are available to talk to people, they are providing services, they're picking up people that they wouldn't perhaps have known, they're meeting people that they always know. It's giving face-to-face -face and access to people. So the NHS needs to engage in these initiatives, but they don't need to take the whole responsibility on, onto itself. Because what happens, the NHS says we're in charge of loneliness, we'll have a national plan, a Secretary of State will make an announcement that we're going to abolish loneliness by 2025, and we all get ourselves into a terrible political argument. Sarah, as an organisation, you know, mind, you work in partnership with the NHS and other organisations because 
it's a network. It's that phrase. It takes a village. The NHS cannot do it all. It does need support. But it can be quite a confusing picture for people. You know, you hear of stories of people being moved from pillar to post when they try to seek out help or treatment, a diagnosis even. So some people will ask the question, who actually runs mental health services? Where should they turn? I think that society wants a bit more understanding about the causes of mental illness, how to keep yourself well, what the real social factors are. So I'm in absolute violent agreement with David that we really need to be very careful about how we talk about mental health and mental illness in today's society, because I think it can be incredibly complicated. I think it's really challenging because ultimately at the moment, people are often told, go to your GP. And the GP has very limited resources and referrals to specialist care, secondary care, the threshold for doing so is very high. So what people tend to do is they tend to use their community resources. And sometimes that's really positive because there is a choice. There are loads of brilliant innovations going on. We often talk about, you know, what we'd like is one front door, but that actually isn't how people operate. So we have to be creative and we have to avoid, I think, the approach that we often take in developing services, which is how do we make it easier for us to provide the services rather than how can we make it easier for people to access them? And that often means having more than one front door. We have to live with the fact that people access help in different ways. And the beauty of the NHS has to be that they are there for the most complex specialist issues In a moment, more on how the pandemic has fuelled a rise in the number of children struggling with their mental health. We talk about waiting lists in the NHS a lot. In 2022, the British Medical Association estimated that there were 1.2 million people on mental health waiting lists. When we look at children, for instance, the pandemic affected children a lot waiting lists for an autism diagnosis is huge. Two to three years on average, just for diagnosis. ADHD looking at four years. Plus there's a problem with shortages of drugs. A huge problem there to tackle. I'm a parent. I know how difficult it has been for children, young people. And we also know that prevalence has increased. So pre-pandemic it was one in nine, it's now one in six children need support with their mental health. And so that is a huge increase in the number of children that are in trouble with their mental health across the country. And it's really hard to kind of quantify exactly what that means in communities, in families. I think we're still trying to understand what happened as a result of the pandemic to children's mental health. So there is a lot of work that's being done. The government have just agreed to invest £5 million in early support hubs for children and young people. Now, this is progress. It's nowhere near as far as as it should be. But those children, young people, early support hubs could be a real opportunity to get people in very early, identify what needs they might have, plug them into support. 50% of adult mental illness actually appears in people before the age of 14. So therefore, there's great opportunity to really delve in and provide some quite hardcore interventions that change the trajectory of people's lives. We've got mental health support teams in schools, which are meant to be brokers into getting children access to support. So there's lots of different initiatives, but I do agree with David that we do need a bit of an umbrella to really understand how it all ties in together. There's no doubt we could spend more money on mental health. Just giving the NHS a load of money to do something will not necessarily tackle those things. But that's why you need this umbrella. This is why you need this work across government to enable it to happen. The reality is, is that we can do so much more before anyone gets to crisis. There are so many interventions we could deploy to reduce the number of people that get to that situation for some that is life and death. And so we're talking about early support hubs. We're talking about community resourcing in all sorts of different ways. We are talking about suicide prevention funding. Those are the things that could make the biggest transformation, shift the dial in the biggest way. If we keep throwing money at the crisis end of the spectrum, we're losing opportunities to really fix the root cause. Rosera said 
there are the solutions out there. It just needs a bit of bravery. It needs a bit of long-term planning and commitment. A lot of what we're talking about is basically invisible to people. It's not like having a queue of ambulances outside hospitals, although, of course, that may have had a mental health issue in it. But we need to think to be able to, to talk more carefully about what mental health services do and how they work. I often feel community mental health services are a bit like air traffic control. You've literally got hundreds of people up there with mental health issues that are being supported from the ground. The staff are working with them and helping them. Sometimes they fall out the sky. Sometimes their treatment collapses and they're set into real problems. So what we need to be able to do is sort of explain these issues much better to the public. Can I just ask you about the suicide prevention strategy? I was there about a decade ago when we were launching the ideas around zero suicide prevention. And there were lots of initiatives around the country talking about that. Now, we have seen over the last decade a decline in the numbers of people taking their own lives. Now, we could argue that the reason being is that the suicide prevention initiatives that we've been doing over the last 10 years have been effective. Now, every suicide is one suicide too many. So I am not by any means suggesting that this is a success. What I am suggesting, though, is that we know it's having an impact. We know that by providing information in local communities. I live in Cambridge and Peterborough, for instance, and in one of my roles many years ago, and it's still going strong today, we developed an initiative called Stop Suicide. We need to be able to give people information and hope. We need to be able to work with public health colleagues in thinking about what are the interventions that actually make a difference. So working with planning colleagues about planning decisions around hotspots for where people might try and take their own lives. The issues that I'm concerned about now are that that is maintained, that we don't take our foot off the pedal, that the government have put in a, an investment. But what we want to see is that that is concurrent, that this is a, an ongoing commitment. We want to still reduce the number of people taking their own lives. We want to see that absolutely reduced by thousands. We're not there yet. But we have had progress. I think that this is a common theme, being persistent and long term mm. in your thinking. And very often that's quite difficult for, for politicians who come in and may spend you know, 12 months as a secretary of state or less sometimes. It's very difficult to get that long term thinking but it's so important if you want to get good outcomes so right one of the things that i get very frustrated by is that short termism in terms of planning and funding for initiatives we have to accept that sometimes we are looking at a decade runtime for something to have the impact that it needs to have and yet we are working often on you know sometimes 12 month cycles to have really strong outcomes if you're lucky, you might even get three years on a funding cycle to see if something works. But we can't operate on that level. Let's go back to that brilliant phrase, Sarah, provocative optimism. What is keeping you optimistic at the moment for the future of that huge umbrella to mental health and its relationship with the NHS? That is a great question. And I have to work quite hard at it because the reality is it's top out there. People providing care in NHS and in communities or charities want to make a difference. And that is stronger than ever. That desire to help people, despite real you know, sense of burnout and exhaustion, that commitment is still there. We've got to lean on our politicians. And, and this sounds a bit kind of, you know, mafioso, but we do have to lean on them a bit to maintain that political momentum. And they've got to make policy that is about creating the good conditions for mental health so that we're not constantly looking at an acute picture. So I am provocatively optimistic, but I'm also very, very aware that we've got to coalesce around these principles together and work hand in glove on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm inspired by what you were saying there, Sarah. The other thing I would say is that the rest of the NHS have got quite a lot to learn from mental health because Mental health have been working in a systemic way, in a way that perhaps running institutions in the NHS, we haven't, we can learn, mm. I think, from all of that. On a slightly less emotional point, we now know more about what works than we've ever known. We can see the evidence, we can 
see in a way we've never done before about where the investment might be focused to get the best outcome for people from. And to deliver that, we need a government that understands that picture. In the present climate, if you do not ring fence resources for mental health, it will never get there. And you've got to trust the people on the ground. Of all the services, mental health does not respond to press releases. I mean, one of the things about the NHS, because it's so large, the numbers are so great. So you do a press release and say we're spending a million pounds across the country on something. It's about threat and safety for each community. Mm -hmm. you know? So you know, get away from all of that and have a long-term plan. So from mental health to public health. That's where we head next time. There's a one in four ratio of poverty in adults and a one in three ratio of poverty in children. So that sort of thing has an impact on life expectancy and the kind of th diseases and ill health that uh, patients present with to their doctors. Dave and I will be back to explore ways to help improve the population's health and the best ways to go about it. <laughs>